I'm delighted you've joined us again for another one of our Sabbath School lessons. We're in lesson number eight, Wisdom for Righteous Living. When you think of the word righteousness, what comes to your mind? Right doing, probably, or living in the right way. So when the Bible talks about righteousness, it talks about the righteousness of Christ. He is the righteous one who lived righteously. But as we come to Jesus, his righteousness covers our sins. We come to him and his pardon, his forgiveness gives us a new peace. We come to him and he gives us a new power to live righteously. Our text says, our memory text under Sabbath afternoon's lesson is a fascinating text. It comes from Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. What does it mean to number our days? Does it mean that I simply count how old I am at 78 years old? What does it mean to number our days? In the Bible, to number our days means that we treasure every moment as a valued gift of Christ to live a godly, righteous life. To number our days means that we live for God to fulfill his everlasting purpose for our life. I love the way the author puts it in Sabbath afternoon's lesson in the last sentence there in Sabbath afternoon. Thus the prayer that God would teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom reflects an ongoing commitment to walk in faithfulness to the Lord. So what's numbering our days? It's being faithful to God every single day that we live and thanking God for the gift of life. How do we do that? Well, David says, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's the title of Sunday's lesson. Your word have I hid in my heart. The Word of God is life-giving. The Word of God is life-transformational. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says that the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. In Sunday, we have a twofold question in Sunday's lesson. The first part is how should we keep God's commandments? And second, what are the blessings from doing that? The author gives us Psalm 119. When you look at Psalm 119, in the first 16 verses, it talks about blessed are the undefiled. It uses the term undefiled. It talks about the fact that God has called us to serve him with a whole heart. It talks about hiding the word of God in our heart. It talks about meditating upon his precepts. How do we put all that together? We serve God with a whole heart when we come with the prime desire to live in harmony with his will and to be faithful to him. So serving God with the whole heart means that we don't have a selfish desire. I'm not serving God in order to be saved. I'm serving God because I am saved. Apple trees do not produce apples to become apple trees. They produce apples because they are apple trees, right? I do not do good works to become a Christian. I do good works because I am a Christian. You see, to serve God with an undefiled heart, to serve God with my whole heart, means I come to him in praise. I come to him in adoration. I come to him thanking him for his goodness, thanking him for his grace, thanking him for his mercy, and all I want to do is please the one that saved me and redeemed me. Now, what are the results of that? Psalm 119, verse 165, I think is one of the most powerful verses in all the Bible on the results of obedience. It says, Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. Great peace have those who love your law your law. When we love Jesus, we are led to be obedient. And in that obedient life, we recognize that his way of life 
is the best way of life. And that leads us to have peace and joy and purpose in our life. Now notice what it says is, blessed are the undefiled that walk in his way. If you think about the Old Testament, what do you think about that word undefiled? Now remember God told Israel, bring an undefiled sacrifice. So what you're really thinking about when you think about that word undefiled is the Israelites who brought a sacrifice that was undefiled without spot and blemish. So when I come with an undefiled heart, I come with an honest heart, a pure heart, a heart that I say, God, I don't want anything between you and me. Don't you remember that old song, nothing between my soul and my savior, not of this world's delusive dream, nothing between. That's the undefiled heart. At the end of the lesson, Sunday's lesson we read, God's commands are a revelation of God's will for the world. They instruct people on how to become wise and to live in freedom and peace. The psalmist delights in the law because the law assures him of God's faithfulness. Great peace are they who love your law. Nothing causes them to stumble. Then listen to this. The image of stumbling depicts moral failure. As the lamp to the psalmist's feet, God's word protects us from temptation. So as we live in harmony with the word of God, we don't walk in darkness and stumble over the temptations of Satan. But the word of God, thy word is a lamp unto our feet. Thy word is a light unto our path. Now, Monday's lesson, we've talked about what it means to teach us to number our days. Um, when I read Psalm 102, verse 1, it helps me to know the frailty of human life. Let's look at a couple passages on the frailty of human life. Psalm 102, verse 1. It says here in, 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 in Scripture, Hear my prayer, O Lord, let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of trouble. Incline your ear to me in the day that I will answer. I call and answer me speedily. Verse, th uh, verse 3. For my days are consumed like smoke. My bones are burned like the hearth. Verse 11 of Psalm 102. My days are like a shadow that lengthens and I wither away like grass. What's he talking about? My days are consumed like smoke. When you have a fire, the smoke goes up and it's gone, right? Uh, my days are like a shadow that lengthens. What does that mean? In other words, when night comes, your, your shadow lengthens. That's, but soon... Your shadow is gone when it is dark completely. You look, for example, at Psalm 103, verse 14 to 16. Scripture says, For he knows our frame and remembers we are what? Dust. As for man, his days are like grass as a flower of the field. So he flourishes, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. David is pointing out that life is quick. You know, as I look back over my own life, I would never have believed that it would have gone so fast. My wife and I have been married now some 57 years. It seems like yesterday, really. Uh, we have three children. Our oldest daughter is in her 50s. I can't believe it. You know, life goes by so fast. I think about my first district in ministry, Quinnebog. Well, I was in Hartford, Connecticut as an associate pastor, but my first district that I pastored by myself, Quinnebog, Connecticut. I mean, I began ministry 57 years ago. And you think about how quickly it goes by. This is what David is saying here. What David is saying is the wisest way to live is to live a life of faithfulness, live a life of consecration, live a life of dedication to, to, to God. Here, if you look at the second to last paragraph in Monday's lesson, wisdom in the Bible depicts not merely intelligence, but reverence for God. The wisdom that we need is knowing how to number our days. If we can number our days, it means that our days are limited, and we know they're limited. Wise living means living with the awareness of life's transience, that's its shortness, that leads to faith and obedience. So we live a life recognizing 
that one day the funeral will be ours. Unless Jesus comes, of course, and we long for that day. One day the casket will be ours. One day that place in the cemetery will be ours. Unless Jesus comes, right? Are we long for that day? Again, I say it. But we recognize, you know, you look at the obituary column and you see friends that are dying. To number our days means that we live in the light of eternity, making the wisest decisions possible every single day. Now, God allows tests to come upon us and trials test trust. Here are the three T's. You got it? Trials test trust. Go ahead and say it with me. Trials do what? Test trust. You find that in Psalm 95, verse 7 to 11. Psalm 95, verse 7 to 11. Your trials that you face every day are going to test your trust in God. Psalm 95, verse 7 to 11. Here we go. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. When your fathers tested me, they proved me, though they saw my work. What does it mean we test God? When we trust God, we open our hearts to receive God's blessings. We test God by rebelling against him and forfeiting his blessings. So this idea of testing God comes from the fact of testing how merciful he will be to us in sin testing how good he will be to us when we rebel against him. And so David says, look, Israel rebelled against God. And when Israel rebelled against God, they tested God. Would God still protect them? Would God still keep them in favor with their enemies? Would God still give them health and strength? So they were testing God in that sense of how far they could push God. When you and I face trials in our life, it is a test of our faith. When we rebel against God, it is a test of how much God's mercy will still reach out to us when we rebel against him. Fallen human existence, first paragraph, Monday's lesson, fallen human existence is but a vapor in the light of eternity. A thousand years in God's sight are like a watch in the night, when, which lasted three or four hours, that's a watch. Compared to divine time, human life flies away. The strongest among humans are weak when it comes to looking even at the plants, you know, uh, trees. You look at a tree, you know, I was w walking here in Florida, just we, my wife and I were here for, uh, for a while, and we were walking on a Sabbath afternoon on a boardwalk, and we looked at cypress trees that were supposedly 500 years old, and they probably are. I mean, they're 12 feet around, 10 feet around, some of them. And I began to think, that tree was here 500 years ago. I mean, amazing. America's founded, what, 1792 or something? And the 1800s, I mean, how old is America? We celebrated not long ago, our 200 and some birthday. But that tree was here 300 years before that. It's just amazing to think about it. So what David is doing is he's contrasting the brevity of our life with nature all around us that has been here and, and thrived. You know, sometimes I, 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 when I'm hiking in the mountains, I look at the mountains and I think to myself, mountains, if you could speak, what could you tell me? You were here 100 years ago, 300 years ago, 500 years ago. I thought, what, what could you tell me? Mountains. So living life in obedience to God, even in the trials of life that test our faith, recognize we recognize that we're numbering our days. We're numbering our days. We're living wisely before God. Here, it says, wisdom in the Bible depicts not merely intelligence, but reverence for God. The wisdom that we need is knowing how to number our days. If we can number our days, it means that our days are limited, that we know that they're limited. Wise living. Remember I read that to you, didn't I? Wise living means what? 
that we live always in the light of eternity. Trials always, always lead us to be bitter or better. Trials always lead us to reveal in our life God's glory or anger, resentment. Trials always lead us either to deeper trust and deeper faith or to walk disobediently. Look, February 20th, Tuesday's lesson, last few lines. Disobedience not only hardens the heart and the conscience of the guilty one, but it tends to corrupt the faith of others. That which, and this is Ellen White from Testimonies to the Church, volume 4, page 146, that which looked very wrong to them at first gradually loses its appearance by being constantly before them till finally they question whether it's really sin and unconsciously fall in the same way. Look, the more you compromise your life because you're having trials in your life, you're having difficulties in your life, the more you compromise, the more in that compromise you will tend to have a hardened heart. You know, when you look, for example, at uh, Psalm 141, Psalm 141, the psalmist prays and he prays, Psalm 141, he prays that he'll never have a hardened heart. He prays that his mind will always be open to the things of God. He prays that he'll live wisely and number his days for all eternity. He says, Lord, I cry out to you, Psalm 141, verse 1. Make haste to me. Give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense. The lifting up my hands is the evening sacrifice. Now look at this one. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men who work iniquity. Set a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Why do you think it says the door of my lips? In ancient cities, the door was the most vulnerable place for attack. The door was the place where the enemy would enter. But here, David says, don't let the enemy enter your life. Don't be vulnerable for attack. You know, the deceitfulness of the wicked way. Now, there's something else that's quite interesting here. We're going to see it as well in Thursday's lesson. Set a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. See, often it's our words. Often it's our mouth that gets us into the most trouble. We can speak condemnatory words of others, critical words of others. Um, do not incline my heart to the evil thing. So when I speak something, my words impact me. My words impact my heart. And do not incline my heart to an evil thing. To practice wicked works with men who work, wicked in, work iniquity. Now notice, if I speak critical words of others, my heart begins to drift from God my associates, and my associates become those who also are condemnatory, those who are also critical, those are also those also who speak condemnatory words, and I walk further from God. So here, what David is saying is, look, be faithful to God, number your days, guard the words that you speak. Take an inventory of your words. Have you done that recently? I want you to think back over this last week. Have you been critical? Have you condemned others? Have you complained in the trials of your life? As we just saw in Wednesday's lesson, has you try, have your trials brought you closer to God or have they made you more bitter? Here in this lesson, we read that Satan is very progressive and he's very cunning. When I first became a Christian and a Seventh-day Adventist, I had a wonderful Bible teacher Layman was an elder of the church, and uh, he would teach us to memorize Bible texts. And one of the texts he taught us to memorize, we memorized as young people, Psalm 96, Psalm 46, uh, Psalm um, 1. And I want you to think about Psalm 1, because it's the next psalm that our author mentions in Wednesday's lesson. It goes like this. I, I memorized this when I was 17 years old, which would have been... Uh, now, uh, over 60 years ago, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth 
in the seat in the, in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he walks day and night. Now there are three things there that are very fascinating. Blessed is the man that does what? That does what? Go back. There are three things. I don't want you to miss it. So I want you to go back to Psalm 1. Because this shows you the progression of compromise. And it shows you what compromise actually does. Blessed is the man who walks, not in the counsel of the young guy. So first you walk. Then who stands in the path of sinners. You don't walk by them. You stand with them. Then what? Nor sits in the seat of the scornful. So you walk. You stand, you sit. That shows us the progression of compromise. Uh, here it says, uh, the uh, second paragraph under the second section, Psalm 1, it says, Likewise in Psalm 1 verse 1, the temptation comes to prevent God's child from walking in the Lord's way by casting, causing him to walk with the wicked, stand in the path of sinners, and finally to sit with the scornful. Sinners, wicked and scornful, we're not to be like them, or let us be led away from the Lord. See, here is compromise, compromise, compromise. Whatever you do in your life, determine that you're going to number your days. Determine in numbering those days you're going to be faithful to God. And determine by the grace of God that you will not allow the little compromises to come into your life that defile the soul and harden the heart and keep you from a meaningful relationship with Jesus because there are blessings, Thursday's lesson, in righteous living. In Psalm chapter 1, just look at the blessings, verse 3. But let's look at verse 2 and 3. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted in the rivers of waters that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf also shall not wither. Whatever he does shall prosper. What a picture. A picture of a tree. The leaves are lush and green. The fruit is magnificent. The roots go deep and are watered. It's a, it's a vision of prosperity. Blessed is that man who meditates, who delights in the law of God. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of the water. Whatever he's doing is going to prosper. God is going to prosper your life if you number your days, if you live every day in harmony with his will. Great peace have they which love thy law. And what? Nothing, nothing shall offend them. Or you look, for example, at Psalm 128. Look at the blessing that comes from those who have faith in, those who trust in God. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. What is blessing? It's the Hebrew word asher. Happy is the one who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy. Wow. And it shall be well with you. Did you notice the three things? Blessed, that's an internal happiness or peace. Um, then there's happiness, that's joy. Smile on your face, a sparkle on your eyes. And it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. Your children like olive plants. In other words, you can have good family relationships. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord will bless you out of Zion that you may see the good of Jerusalem. All the days of your life, yes, may you see your children's children. The Bible does not tell us that there'll be no trials, there'll be no difficulties or challenges, but here's what the Bible tells us. If we are faithful to God, there'll be blessings abundant that come in our life that we don't yet realize. Number your days. Every day, make an eternal decision that you are going to live in harmony with God's kingdom and live for his kingdom. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that we can number our days. Thank you that there's a blessing that comes from Jesus, a blessing that comes as we follow your way, as we live in harmony with your purposes. As the psalmist writes in this last psalm that we just read, there's a happiness, there's a joy, 
there is a wellness in following you. And we thank you for that. Lord, help us to be very faithful in following you always. In Christ's name.